Okay, so today we're going to talk about measurements and problem solving. And so in chapter one, we want to talk about why and how we measure uh, the SI units of length, mass, and time, more about the metric system, unit analysis, uh, unit conversions, significant figures, and problem solving. So in physics, we attempt to describe nature in an objective way through measuring things. Measurements are expressed in units, officially accepted, uh, the officially accepted units are called standard units. And major systems of units uh, are basically the metric system and the British system. Uh, but we, we use the US system, but the British system is no longer used in, in British culture. Um, so length, mass, and time are fundamental quantities. And combinations of them will form the units that we will use all the way up through chapter 14. In this text, we will be using the SI system, and uh, which is based on the metric system. So the first thing I want to talk about is that the SI unit of length is a meter. The original definition is on the left. Um, it was uh, basically um, based on the equator and the North Pole, and the distance from the North Pole to the equator was about 10 million meters. Um, but now we use the amount of time, it, or if you if you take one over 299 million 792,458 seconds. One over that seconds. Uh, that's how far um, a photon can travel is exactly one meter. Um, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram. Originally the kilogram um, was a mass of 0.10 uh, meters cube of water, um, which is about a thousand milliliters of water. Now the standard kilogram is uh, a platinum iridium uh, cylinder kept at the French Bureau of Weights and Measures. So originally it was just water, but water is subject to pressure and um, at sea level is what it was the accepted standard. But then if you're not at sea level, in other words, if you're up in the mountains in an elevated spot, uh, the, you know, because there's less pressure, the higher you go, it changes the volume of the water and the mass and all that. So um, that's the standard now. And then one second is defined as a certain number of oscillations of uh, cesium-133-13. So in one second, there are 9,192,631,000 uh, uh, oscillations uh, of the cesium-133. So in addition to length, mass, and time, base units in the SI system include electric current, temperature, amount of substance, and uh, luminous intensity. These seven units are believed uh, to be all that are necessary to describe all phenomena in nature. And so here we have length is meter, mass is kilogram, time is second, uh, electric current we measure in amps, temperature, Kelvin is the standard, uh, amount of substance is mole, and then luminous intensity is candela. The British uh, system of units is used in the US with basic units being the foot pound um, and second. However, the SI system is virtually ubiquitous outside the United States. Uh, everybody uses it and it makes sense to become familiar with it. So if you're a scientist in the US and you're going to do a lot of work and you want to publish it, you've got to convert it to meters, uh, kilogram seconds or the SI system. And the metric system units are the same type of quantity, length or time, for example, and differ from each other by factors of 10. So here are some common prefixes. So if we come in here, let me move this out of the way so you can see, tera is 10 to the 12th of whatever it is. So you could have tera kilograms, uh, tera meters, tera seconds, but it's 10 to the 12th, giga is 10 to the 9th, mega is 10 to the 6th, kilo is 10 to the 3rd, hect hecto is 10 to the 2nd, deca is 10, Deci is 10 to the negative uh, 1, centi is 10 to the negative 2, uh, milli is 10 to the negative 3, and so on and so forth. So when they talk about nanotechnology, um, here as you can see, nano is 10 to the negative 9th, so that means that those measurements are around 10 to the negative 9th meters when talk, people talk about nanotechnology. Um, the basic unit of volume in the SI system is a cubic meter, however, this is rather large for everyday use, so the volume of a cube uh, of 0.1 meters um, on a side is called a liter. So a liter isn't, a, a cubic meter is a lot. In fact, if I remember correctly, it should convert out to about a thousand liters, which is a lot of water, I guess, or any fluid. 
Um, so a standard unit then would be a liter, which is actually 0.1 meters per side. Recall the original definition of a kilogram, one kilogram of water has the volume of one liter. And that's at sea level. A powerful way to check your calculations is to use unit analysis. Not only must the numerical values on both sides of the equation be equal, the units must be equal as well. Uh, I'll show you guys how to do this, but if we're solving for um, a mass of an object, we should have kilograms left over. So as we progress and learn more and more, and we talk about force and acceleration, but we're solving for the mass, all of the units should cancel out algebraically speaking, and you should be left with mass. Const uh, likely, if, um, or similarly, if we have, uh, we're solving for time, it should end in seconds, length should end in meters, area should be meters uh, squared, velocity should be meters per second, and if we're solving for an acceleration, it should be meters uh, per second squared. So here's an example of how we can manipulate algebraically to find the quantities that we're looking for. So here is a kinematic equation for final velocity, which is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. Each one of these measurements has a, um, uh, a unit that can be analyzed. So velocity is meters per second. This velocity should be meters per second. And this would be meters per second squared because it's the acceleration and time is measured in seconds. Now, if we go through algebraically, these seconds should cancel and I got meters per second should equal some meters per second plus meters per second. So on the right hand side of the equal sign we have two times meters per second but that's okay. As long as we end up with meters per second um, it, it should be fine. So that, whoops, kind of got ahead of ourselves. Um, that equation is dimensionally correct and that's what we'll look for. We're going to learn to do that in the context of solving our problems and you'll see. Um, 1.5 unit conversion. A conversion factor simply lets you know an expression of quantity in terms of other units without changing its physical value or size. So for example, if I wanted to convert 12 feet to yards, I know that there is one yard in three feet. I put the three feet on the bottom of this ratio because then that allows me to cancel the feet with the feet, leaving me with yards on the top. The fraction in blue is what we call the conversion factor and its numerical value is equal to one because we know that one yard is equal to three feet. Calculations may contain two types of numbers, exact numbers and measured numbers. Exact numbers are part of a definition such as two in the equation d is equal to 2r or the diameter is equal to times the radius. Measured numbers are just that. For example, we might measure the radius of a circle to be exactly 10.3 centimeters, but that measurement is not exact. Now here they're being sticklers about exact and precision and accuracy. We know mathematically that the radius times 2 will always equal the diameter, and we say that 2 is an exact value because, well, that's just what it is. It doesn't change. There's no speculation. Here when we measure something and we say it's 10.3 centimeters, well, there's an issue of precision and accuracy. What if it was 10.299, but by the way that we looked at the ruler when we measured it, it was 0.3. So there's a level of certainty that comes into play, therefore we can't refer to it as exact. We would say that measurements are not exact due to human error and the way that we measure things. When dealing with measured numbers, it is use, uh, useful to consider the number of significant figures. Uh, the significant figures in any measurement are digits that are known with certainty, plus one digit that is uncertain. It is easy to create answers that may have digits that are not significantly uh, significant using a calculator. For example, 1, point, 1 over 3 on a calculator shows as 0 0.3333333. Three. But if we just cut a pie into three pieces, um, how well do we really know that each one is one-third of the whole? So again, this is due to human error. We have a certain level of certainty versus uncertainty. So significant figures and calculations are important, and here are some rules to follow. When multiplying and dividing quantities, leave as many as significant figures in the answer as there are in the quantity of the least number of significant figures. And I'll do some examples in class to explain that, but for now, just write this down in your notes. When adding or subtracting quantities, leave the same number of decimals rounded in the answer as there are in the quantity with the least number of decimal places. So what this means is if I have a measurement that's only carried out to one decimal place, that's the highest level of certainty I have. Even if I have an instrument uh, of a different measurement that is three or four decimal places. Well, because the one measurement only had one decimal place, 
that's the, the highest level of certainty I can have. So all the calculations, when I'm multiplying or dividing or adding and subtracting, all of those can only be carried out to the least number of um, decimal places. Uh, I hope that makes sense. It makes more sense when we look at it. So lastly, problem solving. This is really the scientific method to some degree, just reworded a little differently. And so here's the steps that we would use to solve a problem in physics. First, we read the problem carefully and analyze it. When appropriate, we try to draw a diagram or picture. Next, we would write down any of the data that's given to us, what is to be found. This is helpful when you have to choose an equation. Um, if they list a mass and an acceleration and they ask for a force, it's pretty easy to determine which formula to use. But if they give us a change in velocity and we have to calculate the mass and they ask for force, step number three is crucial in figuring out how we get to, to the point where we're able to use the formula we need. Step four is to determine which principle is applicable. If they're asking about force, we wouldn't use an equation that helps us find energy. So that, that's important. And then five, perform the calculations with the given data. And then six, consider whether the results are reasonable. Now sometimes in our calculations we make errors. So if I was calculating like the mass of a human being and I did my math and it came out to like 100,000 uh, nanometers, uh, that would be weird because one, mass is in kilograms, and two, 100,000 seems like an unreasonable answer. Uh, so when we're all done, we really want to ask ourselves, D does this number and the unit attached to it, uh, the dimensional analysis match up with the question that I'm being asked? And sometimes they don't, and that's usually based on human error. We make a mistake, choose the wrong formula, hit the wrong button on the calculator. That's why it's always important to double check the answers. Um, Here's another way to think about problem solving. The table on the left describes several, several types of examples that are used in the text. So um, most of the time, this is a mathematical thing in nature. So we want to think it through like it's a story problem. And sometimes we have an integrated example where there's like a conceptual application that occurs and that helps us to determine the, the equation that we use. And then lastly, there's uh, some conceptual examples. Now these can be done without calculations. We're just using reasoning and answering. So um, if we know that everything that goes up must come down due to gravity and we're asked a question, uh, if you're on the moon and you throw a hammer up in the air, what happens? Well, we know that it's going to come down eventually, um, but the moon is less massive than the earth, so the gravity isn't as strong. Now, the text may just want you to think that through and you don't necessarily have to calculate the acceleration due to gravity on the moon. Um, so, so there's three different types of problems we'll be doing in the text. And those are the three. So in review, SI units are of length, mass, and time, which are in the metric system, meter, kilogram, and second. So all of our answers will have to be converted to meters, kilograms, and second. Even if it's uh, kilometers, we still got to switch it to meters. If they give us a time an hour, we still have to switch it uh, to seconds, and so on and so forth. Remember that a liter is 1,000 cubic uh, centimeters and that one liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. That one's critical. A lot of your homework problems use that one to get you back and forth from volume to mass. Last, or not second to last, I should say, unit analysis can be made to verify, or can be used um, to verify answers to problems. So if we're solving for time and our answer ends in meters, we've done something wrong. And then significant figures deal with uh, the issue of certainty we can only be certain of our accuracy to the lowest decimal point. And we'll talk more about that in your homework. When it comes to solving problems, because that's what we're going to do in this class, is son atol, son a, solve a ton of problems, what we want to do is we want to read the problem carefully. Next, we want to draw a picture. Then we want to write down what we know, and then write down the stuff that we need to know. And then we're going to determine which principles are applicable. If we're solving for energy, use an equation for energy. Um, although sometimes we use other equations to get to energy, but that's where we got to think our way through. Five, uh, perform calculations with given data. And then six would be consider if the results are reasonable. So we always want to do a common sense check at the end and make sure uh, that our answer actually answers the question that we're being asked.